after. We'll see how that works out, but definitely the Marana. A bit of a surprise pick to go around with the uh, Enchantress. But again, we're going to be moving on into this game then. The second semi-finals of today. Let's send it over to the commentators as the players load in. Thank you very much. Uh, we are here to commentate your <laughs> commentate your matchup. DK versus EG. I'm Toby One, joined by Cinderin. And man, we got one hell of a game to start with. Yeah, this is one of the one of the most anticipated games I think for uh, for a lot of people. EG and DK have both been doing very well in the tournament. Uh, the last time they met was actually very close to the end of the group stage, and DK ended up taking that. So uh, I I can imagine oh. EG are hungry for some revenge here. They might actually get something right now. Getting right into it here. Slowed down. The static link is on. The arrow from Mason will connect, and Lanham he's already in trouble. Not but he's level nature's guys. It's the first level, but there's a static link putting a big lightning pole on Lanham's butt. But they push him back out. And he remains in Viz, gets a ward down, but this means no leech seat, no living armor from the very, very start, but no first blood EG's way. That was a pretty interesting play here. Being forced to level Nature's guys first, I guess he's just really happy they didn't have any detection. It's actually two things that happen right here. First of all, it keeps him alive, and secondly, it, it tells DK, okay, if there's no sentries on EG's side, we can actually successfully block their jungle unless they can the buy them somewhere, begins. but I don't think any of EG's heroes actually have the gold for sentry wards right now, so... And uh, might you, be up you've to a little bit of a rough universe. Start. Uh, universe has like 290 right now, so he's got something in the yeah. kitty. Okay, the offlaner could technically buy them, but yeah. you generally wouldn't want to do that with a dire offlane tide. So, uh, yeah, actually, let's just uh, have a look at the lanes right away. So, for Team Evil Geniuses in the offlane, as we just mentioned, it is going to be Universe playing on the Tide Hunter towards mid lane. Arteezy will be playing as Razor. And then finally, in the safe lane tri lane, I guess we can call it for EG, it's going to be Zai on Ursa, PPD on Enchantress, and finally Mason on the Mirana. So, a position for Ursa? This is very strange. It's kind of hilarious that they're doing this up against. DK, a hero which they banned away from DK, which was the Juggernaut, where they did something very similar. You get these very powerful melee heroes coming out in the early stages, but you run them as supports. Oh, bottom lane universe is actually getting opened on right here. I don't think they have the damage for now, but great harassment coming in from, uh, from DK. Invoker, pretty weak hero on level one. <laughs> yeah, you try <laughs> attack. You try and look for the control out for him as well. Like we go first level Exhort. If you, even if he had the second level, it would just be a Sunstrike, and that wouldn't be enough damage. And they're power leveling Zai inside the jungle too. So you've done a double stack using a tornado to go to work, and Zai's gonna get some really, really quick levels here. Now, I'm interested to see how they're gonna try and capitalize on the Ursa. Do they just try and get him a Morbid Mask very early on and send him into the Roshan pit all the time? Lanham's being a bit of a nuisance as well to PPD. He's staying in vision right on the tail of this Enchantress. They need yeah, sentry wards for here. It's a big problem for EG if Lanham manages to steal a lot of the stack experience from, uh, from the second stack as well. There's actually still the Centaur here, but. Great play here from Lanham so far to, if nothing else, then scout them out. So, mm -hmm. like you said, what EG... Oh, they... Oh, my goodness. They tried to smoke, and it immediately gets countered by Lanham. He's also going to sentry the big camp, so really, really not the start EG were looking for. They actually wanted to probably go for Roche already, since they have two Centaurs and the Earth on level two, and they might still try for it, but... Lanham spotting out the smoke there might know they're up to something. It's going to be really difficult to do this. Like you don't have life steal. Yes, he said like two centaurs. So you can just you can split the attack damage between them. But at the same time, actually, don't know who from DK is going to look for this. You could invoke some strike from Ice 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 and then have a bit of a look inside the pit. That's one way to do it. But are you really going to go down there and contest what is taking the two supports of EG from going for Roshan? I guess not. I mean, the the one hero that could really Get a lot of work done right here would be the Weaver just sneaking in and spotting it out, maybe even stealing the Aegis, but Look at our team. DK are not ready for this. It's going to be a no, Roshan two and a half minutes in down. for Team Evil Geniuses and now level four Ursa. And my concern with this is if you're playing a position four Ursa, which I think I've never seen in a competitive game before, or at least it's very, very rare, and you're playing against a pushing lineup, it's, if this kind of Roshan does not work out for you, mm -hmm. like the panel said, who's going to actually stop the push lineup that DK are running? But if they get a head start like this with a very farmed Ursa, he could very quickly get maybe a blink BKB and just run in and, and try to counter out the Death Prophet. Even more beyond that, like you're, you're actually power leveling technically at Enchantress, so you're going to bring Impetus to, to the light of day a lot earlier than you normally would. And what are you really trading off here? You have Mason, who's having a rather difficult time up on top lane up against Burning, because Burning is like 90, he's 19 for 6 right now up against a Mason who's 8 for 0. And Mason, he's taking so much harassment of Jashin, maybe a little bit too much right now. He's still got Leap available. But the attack's coming in, Sunstrike from Ice Ice Ice. Oh! Mason! Feels it coming. 
and backed himself away from the sun. And that would have actually been a kill. It would have dealt 10 more damage than he had in health. So Mason with a very clutch, very clutch dodge there. So avoids the first flood and like you said, it's going pretty well for EG of course because of the Roshan, but the Moran are not getting too much still. When you have an Ursa who's farming the jungle, I guess you're not too concerned about your position one hero being sacrificed a little bit and I guess the most essential thing for DK for EG's lineup, sorry, to defend against DK's early push is to get the level six on the Tidehunter. Whereas for DK, well, what are we looking at? Good farm on Weaver. Mid lane, Mushi is losing space quite man. a bit to RTZ. They're making space. Sai and PPD, look at them. They're ready to go. MMY's coming up for a rune check, and PPD's going to slow him down. Sai, he's looking for the first blood for EG. There goes your clap, and look and slice it. They have to hold him there for a while, but it won't be enough time for MMY to survive. First blood goes to Evil Geniuses. Zion's gonna get harassed by Ice 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 with the Sun Strike. Oh snap, Zion so low! He's got enough life points. He's still got the Aegis Immortal as well to keep that in mind. But he does not want to burn this this early on. I think he's going to be really happy to hold on to that Aegis for now. It might give them the opportunity to actually go for an opening here. Knowing that Cold Snap is on cooldown for a little while longer and Ice 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 is generally low on mana, they might try for something in bottom or they go for a rotation in towards the mid, maybe healing him up here with, uh, with PPD. Considering you have an Enchantress who has now basically laid claim to the Radiant Side jungle, you probably want to try and force something in the bottom lane. Ice 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 and Invoker, not the greatest counter pusher there in the world. And if he does get close up against the Ursa, maybe just having a spare point up in Wex to have that Invis, Maybe, maybe useful, but then again, look at Zai. He's walking around with dust. He's prepared to gank up probably Razor or Tree, uh, uh, not Razor, the Weaver or the Tree. Maybe then it would also work up against Ice Ice Ice. It's being a bit of a nuisance with Forge Grid. Yeah, the one thing I want to point out though is looking at the uh, Golden Experience, generally if we see teams doing level one Roshan, this wasn't level one, it was two and a half uh, yep. minutes in, but very early Roshans, you'd often look at a bigger lead than this. So I think all things considered for DK, they're actually not too far behind. 1500 experience and Radiant's 750 gold isn't really the end of the world. Attack. But it's more about the implications it has in the rest of the game where you can see EG are actually playing really aggressively here in the mid lane. Arteezy Radiant will be draining out a little bit with a link, but they're pressuring the tower. They know they can use the Aegis here on Zai. Question is what trade-off did DK get? Good harassment on Mason up top from burning. He's dominating that Radiant's lane really heavily here. I think DK attack. understand the fact that they can't really take these fights until that Shadow Shaman comes up in higher levels. And of course on bottom lane too, the fact you've got Universe, he's not level six just yet, but gotta keep in mind that when that Ravage is up and running, EG really hit a big moment. And now Lanham, he's in trouble. The dust will pop off here from Zai. And Lanham, one more hit from Zai. He's in range and he gets it. 2-0 for the phase booting Ursa, who's now up to level six as well. Six minutes. <laughs> Not too shabby for fourth position. Yeah, the pocket strategy so far is, I guess we have to call this out of EG, or at least part of it is pretty much a pocket strategy here. It's working out wonderfully so far. Zai is getting a lot out of it. PPD almost level five, which is around oh, the This is going to be bad for Mushi. Oh, he's got a haste room coming into middle lane, and Mushi can't outrun this, which means all the damage is being given over to Arteezy. That living armor will not protect him from this. One more attack, MMY! Holds him in with the shackle. Now he's in, now trouble. Is in trouble. He might be able to pick up two kills here. Platterfield can't reach on Mushi, but it's Arteezy. Sunstrike's coming in with the attack from the tower. It's enough to get a revenge kill in for DK. They go 3 1 now on the board, seven minutes in. Fortunately for, uh, for Arteezy there, he actually died to the tower shot before the Sunstrike. So no experience being claimed there by DK. And very important for, uh, for EG here that Ice 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 does not get that kill. If he gets that, he's up to level seven and a half. Instead now he's a little Radiant's bit short of seven. And they also secure themselves the tower in the mid lane with Enchantress. So yeah. once doing? again, good move by EG, but not building that big of a lead actually. I'm still a little bit surprised it's not more than this at this point. I, I'm actually, I'm, co I'm kind of okay with this one. They're, they've taken out a tier one tower in the middle lane. They were looking for some rotations. Their primary thing here probably wasn't just winning on winning on golden experience, because you know you're still going up against a tree protector. Oh, it's taking your tower straight away. Yeah, they're going to commit Ravage as well. This one, he just used Shikuchi. Five seconds on cooldown for that one. Now they see him on the side. Oh, Zai really low in line, but he kind of wants the Aegis to go. But yeah, he walks around the tree line and away to safety. Really important from Burning to not get caught there. He is kind of the, the big farmer for the team right now. What a surprise, <laughs> Burning having the highest CS. So let's say EG continue like this and they keep gaining an advantage. My main concern for their lineup is we talked about how they're going to struggle with dealing with the push. I want to say that's one thing, but the other thing is what counters do you really have to the Weaver? He's getting great farm. You don't have any sort of significant lockdown apart from if you land an amazing arrow from Mason or the Ravage. There's no other counter to Weaver. That hero kind of goes in my book attack. of heroes you you need to counter pick. Yeah. Because with no silence, no reliable stun, etc., Weaver just 
tends to take over the game when you get into that 25-30 minute territory. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of with you on that one too, but at the same time with the EG lineup, they could just play full stay ability and just play man mode. Like if you can get rid of that crop ulti very early on, the mass open wards aren't a major problem for you, then Weaver just running around is not going to be a huge problem because you can still have the lightning rod, you can still have Razor in the middle. Up on top lane, by the way, they're going to have another crack at this. So uh, Zai prepping himself to battle, Burning still got Shikuchi in time lapse, and Mason, he's basically got 100% hit this arrow to kill off Burning. With the support coming in from PPD, he's got double status, so double nukes, but no control. That's pretty much the problem right there. <laughs> just got illustrated. They, really, they can't really, really deal with the Weaver. I, I, so, I'm kind of waiting for like the Blink Dagger from Zai, so then there's something, but like not killing the Weaver, killing Krob or killing someone like that. It's, it's what EG needs to aim to do. I mean, it's great that they've gone for the lead, but they need to get some sort of towers out of it. They got the mid-tier one, which was a great start, but I think they, they realize that they need to put a little bit more pressure on DK here, since DK are getting the way better farm. Mm -hmm. So they're trying to, uh, trying to push down the top tower a little bit here. Ursa is a pretty good tower pusher with, uh, with overpower as well as Enrage, dealing quite significant damage Radiant's to the buildings, but is under attack. He's got living armor. They have to bring it down in Dyer's one go, and I think they know it as well, but attack. I do not expect EG to get away with this, so... They won't. At the end of the day, Dyer's time wasted, basically. Yeah, Mushi even came up towards the top lane. Maybe this is a little bit more of a, like a different time wasted. Uh, they committed Mushi up towards the top lane, which was never really going to get there. But oh, one bottom lane! Oh, Universe is going in, he's going to unload the Ravage there right here. Easy goes. kill on him one. Yeah, but that's the only one they're going to get. They actually committed all three cores to come down to that bottom lane to get the kill. And all they got was the Shadow Shaman. And this is when DK's lineup can actually start playing a kind of split push style, which when you have a Death Prophet to push out the waves really quickly, a Weaver to push out the waves quickly, and an Invoker with double Forge Spirit coming in soon, EG uh, have a lineup that's like tailored to take these... I don't want to say Radiant's directly 5 on 5 team fights, but attack. mainly skirmishes where at least three heroes are involved. Unless Ursa gets a blink dagger, like you said, maybe he can open alone. So the problem is, if DK starts split pushing all the lanes, what are you, how are EG going to deal with it with their Dyer's draft here? Middle tower is and under attack. There's not much way apart from like forcing it. That's the only thing you can really do. But and do you want to force into that? <laughs> well, actually, I think it'll be okay for now, because you're still looking at a Weaver who's going ahead of Midas build. So he's not really going to come online very, very early on. So because of this, in fact now he has the Hand of Midas, he's still going to take a little bit more time before he's up and running. So Mushi is doing exactly what he needs to do. Add pressure towards the mid tower and force the attention of evil geniuses towards him and away from the offlane Weaver. And in addition to that, DK absolutely need to get a level 6 in the Shadow Shaman. I yes. think that's the reason right now that they haven't taken a single tower. We saw it in the previous series, how, how useful those Mass Serpent Wards are. And, and if there's one thing EG have accomplished in this game, it's, sac it's holding down the supports of DK. Neither support is level 6, 11 and a half minutes in. MMY, as a matter of fact, only level 4. He's going to grab level 5 now in the mid lane, but actually even needs to be careful in here. He doesn't even dare to go towards the lane since uh, Mason is trying to flank him here as he saw with the ward. So, the supports from DK really falling behind. The cores are doing great. And the question is, can EG hit the... Um, you know, th there's kind of a sweet spot here where they might be able to take advantage of that, but once the support levels come up on DK, I'm having a very hard time seeing EG running that, that force spot we were talking about. The trees are moving right behind the Marana, stalking the lovely lady. And now, down bottom lane, eye side, side, Satanic already there. Sun Strike, Ball Snap. Arteezy's almost going down at this one. He's taking a lot of damage to start walking the kill, but Lanham comes out of nowhere. Arteezy, he can't hit him fast enough. Arteezy is away to safety. While all these kills are going on, too, Roshan is being attempted by Zai. Now, Mushi has scouted this one out. He's got ulti up in 14 seconds time. You'll see Roshan's half life here. And also, no, 12 minutes in, the second Roshan's available. Top tower denied by Universe. Burning can do nothing to stop that one. As Universe also TPs himself away to safety. So all in all, the trade-off here. DK lose Invoker, they get two towers, of which one gets denied. I would say that's an even trade if EG managed to get the, the Roshan, but it's not just about, like you said, the golden experience, the map control. When the, when the towers start falling for EG, it gets a little more scary to move around the map, and DK with this great ability to just keep pressuring the lanes, I'm having a hard time seeing EG Dyer's getting in and getting the Roshan for free again. Attack. They might EG's. actually be able to do it right now, but EG's got a fight is right it now. really for free then, though? EG's got to fight. They're actually uh, using Moonlight Shadow, but they're going to realize there's a crop illusion in here, so they can't take the Roshan straight away. They need that crop illusion. I'm out for 30 seconds, so they say, screw it. Kill us straight away. Quite a bit of lag. Pause to think about it. Yeah, lag. So we'll just have ourselves a moment. But you can see the pressure, like, they smoked up an instant thought. Okay, well, there's two TPs, oh, there's one TP coming to the bottom line to support the hero on my PG. 
and then three heroes that were looking to come down through the through the enemy jungle. And we could have actually had ourselves a full engagement on bottom lane, but I was still wondering who was on the top of that one, because all the way up on the top lane, you still got burning free farming as this weaver. And what time are we looking at for this? Do we go Lincoln Sphere into whatever damage item we want, more than likely Desolator? When are we going to hit that one? With a head of minus, and he's already 700 gold in, but you're probably looking at maybe a 19 to 20 minute Lincoln Sphere being fully done. It's pretty underwhelming Lincoln's game, though, when we look at Team EG. So the biggest biggest problem that they have to deal with is the Marana Arrow, which can hit the Weaver. Uh, and then, apart from that, well, what is there? The, the static link can make the Lincolns, which, yes, it's annoying for Weaver, but he's generally pretty mobile, so he can get out of there. Yep. So I don't think Lincoln Sphere is actually the right call for being here. He might still get it just, you know, Perseverance being able to they push the lanes constantly, feeling a little bit more safe against a couple of things, but overall, I would probably see a BKB into straight damage build, BKB dead perhaps in, a, in this particular matchup, and and then, again, what do you do? Once when we get to that point when he can freely move around the fights, I think they're, they're going to be in a lot of trouble. Yeah, I'm, I'm still with you on that one, which means like, okay, EG then has to push earlier. They need to get the towers down. Like, we need to have the Maelstrom for Mjolnir over on Mason. We need to be seeing the Enchantress coming in with a full army of the dead, as well as every other she could possibly monitor out of the jungle as well, and forcing out these early towers. Do you then think, okay, Aegis Immortal is the way to do this? We get this in a player like, I don't know, would Arteezy even take this, or do you want it in the Mason once he's got the damage to the tower? And then you fall off the towers. You let the Aegis Immortal burn it, but mainly as a soaked up ability. I think it may even be better over an Ursa. Ursa is capable of body think tank at some point. You just have that Ursa jump in and use it almost like a race king. There's obviously no massive flow when you come out, but the amount of damage you can add onto DK when you first initiate, it may not be enough to split DK out, force that major ability, force it to use both head as well as his shack control, and that'll give freedom for Mason, as well as obviously Universe, Mr. Unread just flying out of the radar in there, and did she get a lot of damage and a lot of control. I would definitely say the timing of EG needs to revolve around Blink Daggers. We've got a guy with a 2100 gold. He has to choose between mech and a Blink right now, and I think with the, ty with the type of line of EG running, it's a little worse. Yes. You want to run it, you want to Blink, instantly get a kill, and maybe transition from that. If you get the Death Prophet in particular early on, yes. you might be able to take it in the fight. I think if he just goes for a mech here, first of all, I would probably start building for it. Hey, instead of just completely one giant, so yeah. I'm imagining he might be getting the mech on the razor here instead, but Ortiz is a drum. So, drum into mech is a kind of ineffective way to build up razor. It's very costly, it doesn't give him any. This, this, spots, this so. looks like just a straight blink dagger from the giant on the. Maybe they could even put the mech over. Oh, no, the Ursus still needs his. Yes. You couldn't build the mech over on the Ursus. Considering that, he also has a pretty, pretty small mana pool for that. So yeah. Not really the idea here or it, but. I'm uh, really surprised that we haven't even started that. Like, this. <laughs> the only thing which we can use is yeah, that, that someone might possibly be building a mech is the fact that you have three branches on the field separated from PVD, Universe, and Sire. It's the only combination you can look at right now which would make you think something like that. Yeah. What are, what are, we, uh, what are we looking at for DK? So we've got Ice Ice building into a, an Orchid, so I guess he wants to just counter out that Ty. A great way of dealing with Ty is having zero damage to or violence, just so you can ignore him. You, yes. you, you lock him and then you don't attack him, so Kraken should have a prop. So when he gets the Orchid on, on the Invoker, that's going to be uh, a great pickup for him. Fever with 800 gold could be anything. I'm still imagining the BKB build could come out. And, um... Well, what else is there? Skills and Death Prophet, but, yeah. Something else that will be there is possibly the thoughts. Also, we'll go back to uh, the James Brew and just find out what their thoughts are of the game's fun. Thank you, Toby. Well, I'm going to put an offer with 10 minutes in with a pause. The story for you guys so far. Well, that level to Rosh, as you were was uh, crucial. But, ooh, David, yeah. We. He, he, yeah, we. Okay. Myself and I, cool. David. Um, he is going to get there. Yeah, they get the question is if DK can hold the base, so it's all about the different time, 11. Oliver, Oliver will be able to play this game until there will be a text for someone who is either Enchantress, either Usa, as it was said, or I don't know, what... Yeah, Oliver, 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 
probably both hang on mine. He did use the ball for a bit higher level. I think DK would have taken countless towers by now. They already got the first couple tier one towers. And those next few towers will drop very fast to a death profit for the Shadow Shaman. So I feel it's only a minute time until EG to start losing towers. They're going to try to go, I imagine, for a rush click here on the, the Tidehunter just to get away from it so they can actually engage the point, try to engage before the season comes out, before the servants come out. But there's no guarantees there. No, no, no. No concern for uh, EG, and you were on draft as well. But yeah, they got two minuses over on the side of PK, and surely they're going to be kicking in on the Invoker and Eva. Is that going to be a factor in this one then? I think they're going to have a lot more impact in the Earth of this game. I think Gods and I had a cast of the game where this exact same thing happened. There was the Chandra's, there was the Ursa on Dire side, you throw a and then really what can you do for that? And Ursa's uh, a really poor hitter, can't get Roshan, can get Roshan is expected, kind of like Lycan throw. And uh, what does it really offer to this? I mean, he has some burst, but they have so much control in a fight uh, with Invoker. I mean, he pulls now as soon as Ursa goes in, I mean, hacked as soon as uh, he goes in too. So I think they control him pretty well, and the team fight is really like, well, they do need that blink dagger on Tyler. Exactly. Do you look at Ravage is a big team fight, but you look at DK, they have more just continual stuns and lockdown. Shadow Shaman with hat shackles, they've got the death prophet spells, they've got the overgrowth, they've got invoke a whole array of spells. I think that's for DK have a big income team fight. I think they're going to just try and tuck the edge just onto DZ uh, and the race and just try and snowball from there, take tower after tower by themselves. Like, DK's kind of soon and do something about that. And the problem that they had is uh, because they went with his um, Ursa and Chantry duo, the other solo lanes will be slightly more vulnerable while you're doing that. And if you look at the matchups, Death Prophet versus Razor. Death Prophet can stop Razor, but Razor can also stop Prophet, so Death Prophet is going to farm. And the Weaver there, he could do whatever he wanted. So you need to do for both strats like this when you have solo lanes that can pair off pretty well and they can do well with other support. But of course, instead of jungling or instead of getting some advantage somewhere else, they're getting hit by doing motion and you do not pay for that. In this case, it's going to be costing EG way too much. So the top potential definitely could be in the case for a bit a little bit longer. You've got the Shadow Shaman hacked and you've of course got the Invoker that can roam around uh, the whip. And then, you know, we have to look at Mace. He's, he's now on the Marana. He doesn't have a huge amount of fun, but these arrows are going to have to be overly important into the match. Because you say you don't have lockdown, you, you will when you get your link on your attack when you get the Ravage, but is it safe to, you know, rely on a bit of RNG, a little bit of arrow? I think you're up to. For each team fight, they have to kill someone uh, either on the back of a rabbit with double blink with Ursa and Tidehunter or a, a really long duration arrow from EG. So, yeah, you kind of have to rely on it. I thought it was a bit worried that the arrow initiation is going to be so much a part of that team fight. Like, you hit someone with an arrow, Ursa can then follow that with a blink and burst someone down. But without that, all they can do is have Rays on the front lines, really tanky. He has a fruit on the field, so. No mech start yet for EG. Well, all those the other worry that are really fresh. They haven't actually got the mech advantage, though. Neither did the mech, but EG could have gone for that early on the raise to say it was a wrong call. That drum is really nice here, especially because there are lots of dice. The Ordinance provide a lot, but it is what something kind of missing to their team fight right now. If EG decide that they need to put on the pressure, you guys, it's, you know, it's they get the tier two towers and they've just got one tier one to get on the top. How ready will K be by that time? They've got two minors, so uh, I think EK will feel like you know, they, they're just going to look to stall. Eh? Like they've been doing so far, they have burning up and top and continuing to split push, apply for the crop across. EG are going to commit five heroes with an H's at a T2 tower. You maybe have your dead prophet there sitting back throwing crypt horns, but you're not actually looking to engage and take a fire. Your beam is just off. You've got two minors. There's no real reason to take a bad engage when you can trade towers with their lineup they have. These fights, I'm assuming, we're going to have to go really well for EG when they get to the tier 2 towers, just because they engage. Yeah, I mean, you have the <coughs> so much follow-up potential yeah. again. If the Weaver is there, she will chase you until the end of eternity. Death Prophet, the same. Invoker, Sunstrikes. 
Well, even DP when um, she gets her yules. Right. You know, it, it's you normally use it. As, you think of DP with yules. You're like, okay, this is an added amount of survivability. You know, it's great for the mana regen. Amazing for the movement speed. And you know, it can maybe stop the Ursa from from locking you down. But even on the chase, if you did, if the fight doesn't go well for Evil Geniuses on the Tier Two Tower, Death Prophet can potentially be an additional kind of chaser to to get a kill. Just because you can yule someone up and then everyone can get into position as long as your Shadow Shaman's there with a hex or a shackle, that's a that's another kill. So it's going to get really um, close, I would say, in terms of how this is going to go. Because if EG can take those tier two towers and take good engagements, they can still, I think, roll with this. Yeah, I think so as well. And yeah, Arteezy thinks that they can keep rolling with the game right now because everyone seems to be ready. All right, game still pause, and it's uh, evil geniuses that are asking to go. How do you like the new emoticons, guys? They're fantastic, and they're being used by many of the Evil Geniuses team right now. You don't get to see it on screen, but if you're watching in Dota TV, I'm sure you can see that. And uh, thank you for everybody for joining us in Dota TV. If you weren't able to get down to the Key Arena, there's over 300,000 people watching this game live, and a lot's riding on it. It's, it's the first game in the series. You want that momentum. Evil Geniuses have come out with a definitely a, a pre-prepared plan. Yeah. And it started off okay, but you guys do seem somewhat concerned. I'm concerned. I don't think EG are out of it by any means. Like I, I feel DK are in a slightly stronger position. It's also because they have like the safer, more conventional draft. With EG, it's kind of a unknown factor. I think they still have lots of ways to win this game. They grab an Aegis, they catch DK out, win a fight or two here or there, and suddenly they're they line up snowball. And you have an Ursa who's not going to be a support. Zai is going to be playing kind of almost like a core hero in this game. More so than like your Tide. Your Tide gets his blink dagger, he's just going to be initiating, maybe work his way towards a mech as well, but there's definitely capabilities for EG to still win this game. It's at, at most, like I would say, a 60 60 40 advantage for DK right now. DK just has a lot of more ease of execution. They, they can drop Rasa Wars, they have Death Prophet Ultimate, they have Invoker, Ford Spears, and then EG has to initiate on them. And if they don't kill like Burning, let's say they double Ravage and they blink in with Ursa, and then someone counters with a Blink Hex or even a Yules on the Ursa, and then he time lapses, the team fight's over from there. So there's also like the Death Prophet with her Yules and Silence, she could potentially. Uh, act in the role of Skywrath Mage and Yules and Silence the Tidehunter as he blinks in. That could be a potentially big play coming out from Death Prophet. Definitely a lot riding on the Universe's Tidehunter yes. in the next kind of five to ten minutes. We'll have to see how those ravages go. So well, that's what we think here at the panel, but we're going to send it back over to the commentators. Maybe they've got some more thoughts as we get ready to go back into the match. Well, Sidner, I don't know about you, but my thoughts are going to be, I hope these guys can keep their momentum, their focus after what is an unfortunate break. Well, the break is over. The game is restarting and we're back in again. So to bring everybody back up to speed, EG started up on the Roshan. The Crop Illusion was looking for it, but DK looks like they want to have not a single bar of trying to stop this. They just look for their trade-offs on a different rates. Yeah, at this point, they they probably know the Roshan is going on since they did scout it beforehand. They're going to drop a Sunspike here as well and realize that the Roshan is going. But like you said, I think DK's goal for now is to either avoid fights directly or take trades. Um, yeah. Even if they sacrifice a tower or two against against EG, that's just going to level up the game pretty much in terms of map control. And as long as their Weaver is free farming, which cannot really pre be prevented by any single hero in EG, it can be prevented by two once Ursa gets a Blink Dagger, then they can burst down burning. Uh, but until that point, he's going to be free farming very nicely in the in the safe, or sorry, in the off lane. So, DK, they'll just be trying to uh, to hold their ground for now, and with a Trian protector, they they might just be able to for a bit. Yeah, they might be able to, which yeah, means EG is going to force even harder. Um, do you remember the double blink as well as the Ghoul Scepter? So EG's got the the way to get themselves really into position, but Mushi has got not only the movers, oh, the regeneration, but everything else. And you're right, MMY on the top lane. Shackles will start not easy. The shot, the stun strike as well. And let him into the lead seat now. Drum touch being popped off. MMY actually going to go down here. That's easy. He didn't steal any kind of extra damage. It's just the end of the now Yubas with the ravage. He keeps that easy alive. The one charges came off cooldown in time. And Arteezy actually gets a double kill out of that. Underrated. I do not. Universe, the clutch player there.
Great counter Dyer's play coming out of, uh, of Universe there. Perfect timing on the Mushi in the enemy middle lane. His eye was chasing him down. He started Radiant's off with a slide, but he couldn't go into attack. the ultimate. But you can see him trying to keep Dyer's his distance. In two seconds, he can blink attack. back into this one. And he wants to. Mushi, they checked the corners, but the wrong one. Radiant's he TP's out to safety. He managed calling. to get a tower as well. This was exactly what EG was looking for. A tower as well as two kills at the trade of absolutely nothing. They've got to be feeling happy about this right now. The gold, or sorry, the score is a little bit misleading in terms of overall gold. It's still a very even game, but EG with those couple of kills as well as Roshan have, have managed to build themselves a quite significant experience advantage. The graph looks a little bit weird because of the long pause, so yeah. the teams weren't playing completely evenly for like six or seven minutes, but... Um, well, at this point, 7-1, to the score for EG. They're getting a little bit of map pressure out in the bottom lane, but in the top lane, DK are pushing the other way. Man, look how well this is working between Lanham as well as MMY. You have Overgrowth when you've got mana for it, which is still short of arcade boots for Lanham, but it's uh, seeing oh, I've seen this before. Yeah, round two, but this time there is not going to be a Ravage to save him, but he's really close to his tier two tower. But the Nature's Guides was allowing MMY as well as Lanham to come in as close as they are. You don't need this Blink Dagger on the Shadow Shaman, because you get this guy one trap. And the one trap. The side, he tears him apart. Artezi will die here, pulling out the damage from Burning. He's just trying to right click him, but Zai's going to give himself a double kill over towards Lanham as well. In fact, the Titans are coming in for that last hit. Blink Dagger, seven seconds, but Burning to the run. They cannot kill him. Dyer's it's amazing how well positioned EG attack. are, considering that these these movements from DK are happening in, in invisibility. They, of course, they read out of the map with the heroes missing. That is pretty likely, but the counterplays out of EG are, are really beautiful. They're using RTZ as pretty much as bait. I don't even know if it's the plan or if they're just expecting that at some point maybe DK go for the kill instead of directly setting up for it. But they get a good trade once again. Funny thing is, again, too, RTZ caught out catching um, like catching farm by using his ultimate. Yeah. Like, he's just spamming that Eye of the Storm. Speaking of ultimate, there's one yeah. deployed in the bottom lane, and Mushi actually using an invis room, so this is... Oh, he actually attacked there, so it does break the invis, and this could expose him to a potential counterplay. Mushi will come in, Zai and Universe. Dyer's Perfectly locked in position. They use Zai up into the air, so he couldn't attack straight away. The tower still does go the way the Death Prophet, because the ultimate uh, obviously killed it off after Fortification wore off. But EG getting a counter kill, a Dyer's tier one tower for a death prop, but they're not going to see that as a worthwhile trade. Well, considering that the tower was bound to drop anyway, I guess they're happy to get a, at least a kill out of it. And Mushi yeah. there, has, he's got to be feeling a little upset about choosing to attack the tower at that point. He could have stayed outside the range and just used his ultimate. I don't know if there was any detection coming in from EG. Actually, okay, looks like Zai had sentry, so they might have killed him off anyway. But the, the tower does fall, and still, I feel like as far as overall map control goes, it's just DK getting more out of the map. And They're going to kill PPD. He's out way too far. Locked between three heroes and the Boom. Sunstrike from... Well, actually, he's not getting the kill. It was Weaver, in fact, who was able to get the last hit in there. And it does indeed look like Burning is going to get either the BKB or the Deso first with that first Mithril Hammer. I don't think there's anything else in the Courier for now. Ice 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 gets himself a Void Stone, so actually transitioning into a yours. I thought he was going to get the uh, the Orchid, but he might have just decided, you know what, guys, it's too late for an Orchid. I would have wanted to have that quite a bit ago, so Surprising. I'll change my build. Maybe he's really still worried about the jump in, or if you can get the timing right, evade the Ravage, Dyer's or make the Ursa wait for you. Attack. And that's not what EG want. EG do not want to just hang around for an extra two or, th two or so seconds and think, hey, now we can now we can tag him. That's not the way this works, because then Burning is going to shred you apart with his ultimate, the tree's going to keep people alive, and you're going to have Shadow Shaman running around also causing havoc for everybody. So EG, they need to jump in, they need to get quick kills, and these Yule Scepters are really going to prevent that from happening. Yeah. Another alternative item that they could have tried to go for here on Team DK could have been the Force Staffs, which are really great against Ursa, but but for now, they're, they're going for the Yules, just like you said, with the goal of just delaying the fight. The longer the fight lasts, the better a chance they have. And it's kind of weird saying that against a, a really farmed Razor, who will generally steal a lot of damage during the fight and then turn around on them. But mm -hmm. I think Arteezy, even with his pretty tanky build, he cannot stay in the fight rel and rely on just being able to run around freely. He's got 7 armor and 1700 health, but he's up against a level 2 Death Prophet Ultimate, 4 Spirits, um, the Shadow Shaman wards, as well as a Weaver, who is soon to get pretty significant damage. It's uh, mm -hmm. it's a tall order. Looks like EG will be uh, looking to push the top tower. Under. It's a double creep wave coming in, and now with a large amount of scarabs, they're going to clean these guys up before the creep wave will be happy to attack onto the tower. Under and the tower's a full life thanks to living armor. But at the same time, Zai's about to lose his Aegis D model, so this is fortified. gone now. He'll have regeneration, he's a full life. Bottom lane, they see Yul's Dantezi out of the fight. 
And with the Mana Serpent Wards as well as the Prom Ulti, the Tier 2 tower will go down on the bottom. A little bit of a mind game, and he gets it! Ah, delaying the attack of the wards while the other two EG heroes try to delay their attack. All looking for that last hit. Now, top tier 1 tower will go down, and Mason actually TPing himself in towards the middle lane. Scouting out Eyesight, Eyesight's down here. There's another TP also on the way in, but Zai is a little bit too far away. Mason leaping to Arrow, going to be evaded. Now, Tempting Blast, the Meteorite, both airballing out, but Mason running back into the flames. So he burns a little bit from all of this, and uh, somehow in 20 minutes in, we have a full rod of Owie now up on Death Prophet. Yeah, it's looking really good for Mushi in this game. His farm is, is definitely where it should be. And when you look at the, the last hits for the two teams, like three of the four, uh, four top farmers right now are on DK way ahead of the corresponding e, uh, EG cores in this game. So if you're a DK fan, this game looks pretty good for you. Oh, you know, yeah, mid lane, he's, uh, he's, <laughs> he's dead. He's dead. Oh, uh, maybe not. Leap down. The bottle charges are there, and Antizi comes up the river. But the Sunstrike damage was enough, and there was no Aether Shock. The arrow is coming in from the side, too. Gonna miss. The Tidehunter, in the meantime, also killing up the Weaver, and Antizi getting Yule stepped it up. So the Weaver actually dying on the top tower, on the top lane where the T1 tower used to be. Yeah, this is the combination that EG can keep pulling off until there's a BKB on burning, and even at that point, they can still do it if they do it really quickly. Of course, I'm talking about the Ravage into just Ursa mauling away at, at the Weaver, so... Mm -hmm. Good kill for EG. Also, not losing Mason there in the mid lane. They keep getting these small victories, but for EG, I'm looking for the big victories. When are they going to come? When are they going to get tier twos? When are they going to take a big Radiant's team fight that it just seems like DK are not attack. giving them? The yeah. only advantage EG has is experience, and it's it's not a small one. It's 7,500 after all, but the way the game is going, levels aren't mattering right now because they're not getting to use their experience in any sort of reasonable fights. Yeah. And one thing also which is which is severely missing is the fact that you don't have the Aghanim to throw over on Razor just yet. Actually, I take that back. He now has enough money for it. I thought the Oak Club might have been like going for an early BKB, but they're going to finish the Aghanims over on Razor, which means now pushing into, into buildings is a lot more effective for EG, but they must win the fight first. I think the Ag Scepter here is the better. Ice, Ice, Ice. He's going on the Enchantress Meteorite. Deafening Blast. Force Spirits. Universe comes in with a Meg and PPT. The Force Spirits are not attacking. They stop because of Untouchable. They are so damn slow. Ice, Ice, Ice gets picked off instead. And PPT is safe. Once again, Universe, the savior for EG. Great arrow from Mason. He's celebrating that in the trees right here. So <laughs> he's having a blast. <laughs> Wanted to get up there as fast as possible with the leap to shoot the arrow. Did get stuck, but easily worth it here getting uh, getting an invoker kill. So again, another small victory for EG. They're starting to build up slowly, but where where do they go from here? I'm I'm looking at BKBs as the next choice, at least for the Ursa for EG, so he can go in and and expect to be able to fight. But even at that point. Trey and Protector is a great counter to Ursa. First of all, Ursa is, has a lot of uh, or fast attacks, but you can counter a lot of the damage with Living Armor on the target. Mm -hmm. And Overgrowth will go through his BKB, so it's not, even, it's not even certain that Zai will be able to bring down a target should he get in correctly in these fights if, uh, if Lanham is in the right position. Yeah. We've got double vision coming up from both these teams. So Trey and Protector as well as uh, Artizi are the two gem carriers for this game. But Arteezy, a man with 1,900 life points and uh, 417 movement speed, rather difficult to kill him off, not to mention his 8 armor. So they're going to be able to see that Weaver, the Treant, the Shadow Shaman. Now Shadow Shaman does need to afford his Blink Dagger, but he already did. He's got 560 gold bonus as well. So MMY is the way to initiate him nicely. But Mushi as well as MMY, like their pushing power is great when you're pushing towers outside the base, but obviously pushing high ground is a whole different affair, and they're gonna need a lot more of an advantage before they can do such a thing. But MMY, TP's top tower, and it looks like DK preparing to fight. A blink in, and there goes Matt Lefort, this time over the wall trap in Universe, gets a rabbit drop, and then why the arrow will kill him off from Mirana. Third strikes on the way, and our team's being pushed back. Whoa. He can't go down. The mains a huge amount of damage. The gems on the deck, but the time lapses at the very last moment. They're on the run up, but the moonlight Shadow giving him protection. Ice 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 has to drop his TP scroll to get that gem out of safety, but now Mushi, he lets the ulti rip the seeds. Universe, the arrow connects on burning, and now there will be support. Mushi's ulti will get the kill. Mason, run him out with. He can't leave himself away. Silence as well. He can't move anywhere. Mushi with a double kill. He opens up the doors and lets EG in. You were talking about that tanky razor, right? Ice 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 is like, who's tanky? <laughs> he pretty much one-shot Arteezy with the combo there. So what's great about the Axe Scepter is, of course, their ability to take the fights. And I thought, maybe he doesn't need the BKB yet, because there's actually not that much disable on DK. I mean, sure, there is the Shadow Shaman with a bit of control, but if they can kite around that or catch him in the Ravage like they did, Razor might be fine.
If you get caught by that combo from Ice Ice, you just drop. Mm -hmm. Look at actually what DK is doing. They're putting both the gems back on the courier. They're sending him both home right now. They don't want to run the risk of giving another gem, giving the gem back over to EG because then it causes too many problems for their invis place. So what they do in the meantime is just bring the gem out when they feel like doing some deep warding. And the rest of the time, PPD, Shackles, Sunstrike. It won't be enough damage, or maybe it will be with a blink down. Lanham, what's he trying to do? He's trying to protect him, or can't get in range with the lead C. MMY must be protected now, and Zai, blink dagger, one second, he can jump. Oh, now he jumps! He's a double clap and the dust off. Lanham forced to use his ultimate. Support's coming in from DK. EG have to back themselves up right now. The lead seed on Zai, the Hex, cancels the TP out. Two seconds, they got to keep that blink dagger on cooldown. PPD cannot help him. He has to let Zai die. TP's not gonna happen. Yule stepping from DK, gets a sound as well on PPD. There's nothing he can do to respond to this apart from death. Very nice Dyer's series of, of execution here from uh, from DK. Just counterplaying every single move from uh, from EG. Immediate overgrowth. He got okay, so he had overpower on. He got one swing off <laughs> before Radiant's he got overgrowth there. So quick on the fingers there, Lanham. Very great play. So they now the small engages that we've seen EG winning, they're starting to lose now. And if they if they begin to lose these, I think they start losing full control of the map. And mm -hmm. they simply can't afford to take these fights. But on the other hand, the the fights they can afford to take, I think DK are just avoiding them on purpose. They're not giving them uh, any sort of space to, to look for what they want. Now, the third Roshan has spawned, and that could be an opening for EG to perhaps force a fight, because maybe DK don't want to give the cheese Roshan away, but... I mean, even then, the problem is, let's imagine EG gets the Roche with Aegis and Cheese. We still haven't really seen them being able to even come close to a tier two for the last 10 minutes. They yeah. they just don't seem to have a grip on the map. Every time they look for an opening, DK just pull themselves back oh, a Oh, that's a big further. item for burning. What do we manage to... That's a big item for burning. So now he's uh, he's got the two core items I was expecting, perhaps in the opposite order of what I was thinking, but he has them now. He is scary in these fights, and he can pretty much move around exactly as he pleases. There's even more to that. She was he got it at the perfect, perfect timing as well, right when the Roche fight is about to begin. I think DK want to try to take this one. Uh, they could try and contest it, but not fully in position for it just yet. The Roche first down the back seven more. It actually blocks the pit outside. He'll finish the job. That's easy. The cheese on the deck picked up there. Bad burning. Running in with a BKB. The arrow has to be soaked up by that BKB as well. The side jumps out. Invoker yules up himself up into the air, evading the battle, and now the gush will come in from Universe. And it's EG who will get in the upper hand here. Mushi will back up. They got Aegis cheese they mop up the mass up mods as well and eg they for the first time get a very very clean fight their way yeah, dk weren't in position to go for that at that point actually they they were kind of forced to go in and i thought they were going to go for it but the heroes weren't at the right place at the right time so burning tried to open it on his own i mean of course he doesn't die because he pops the vkb but eg eg just kite him they leap away the marana at the same time roche is going down very quickly to the ursa they get those they get the roche and even a bonus kill on ice 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 at the moment Roshan dies, I think DK cannot try to commit into that because they just know the threat of Ravage is there constantly and Universe was just biding his time, waiting off pretty much on the on the offside of the fight and yeah, EG gets it for free. Now they need to use it. Yes. They yes, really they need to use it. But they have almost everything up apart from Moonlight Shadow. So they have everything that could help to win them win, uh, help them win the fights. Did we call the Chivas on uh, on Mushi by uh, the way? Just, just quickly, completed? just quickly before, okay. but good to reiterate. Yeah, so uh, that's another big item, of course, coming the way of, of DK. Ice 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 did pick up a Blink Dagger MMI. a while ago. Haven't really seen him He's using it too much yet. They're coming in. They see RTZ and PPD, however. So they're not sure about this. But EG are really flash farming. They just managed to flash farm up the BKB there for RTZ to go with that Aghanim Scepter of his. Because they just kept stacking up the camps and then just mass farming. It's a really good pickup for, for EG at this point. I'm imagining the Ursa... Actually, no. Zai is not even going for a BKB with that ultimate orb of his. I'm imagining it's... Perhaps it's... Hmm. What does he want here? Does he want Mansa to break the overgrowth, or does he want the Scythe as I'm, the opener? I might be the Scythe, but generally on Ursa, we don't see he players picking up Scythe. They usually we prefer the Abyssal. We don't generally see Abyssal. him in fourth position either. No. <laughs> I mean, like, if, if you're playing a core Ursa... The Ursa, rules don't really apply in this game. If you're playing a core Ursa, then yeah, you want to get the Abyssal Blade because you're meant to be the big damage of the big controller. But right now, he knows if he uses Abyssal Blade, if he gets caught by Overgrowth, he can't, he can't do anything with it. So maybe just having the Scythe device is a better option. They need some level of control over Burning, especially considering Burning didn't go for the Lincoln Sphere. You think you might be right on the side of the vice. It's a better way of controlling up the Weaver. The other option is he just says, I'm going full tank and picked up Scotty, but that nah. would be crazy. Kind of underwhelming. I think, yeah. think Scotty and Lincoln's would definitely be the last two choices he's going for with this. 
I'm going to be proven wrong in a moment. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we let the players decide, man. Yeah, we'll see. How's what, PPD looking as well? He's still a long way off having his agonims. Mason is building towards his maelstrom, but he still needs a little bit more. As we get a little bit of sunstrike, they're using it to actually scout on top of the cliff to D ward. Not a bad way of doing it. At the same time, though, Mushi in that top lane starting to uh, put some more pressure on the on the off lane. He's managed to rack up another 2,000 gold. He is getting filthy rich. Actually, he's on par with our TZ's Razor. And Radiant's I think once you reach that late game scenario, this it's generally in most cases going to be more valuable to have a very far death profit. I mean, sure, Razor once he gets the axe refresher gets very very scary, but it's only for a limited amount of time. Then that build kind of starts to fall off. Whereas death profits level three ultimate with level four witchcraft is very powerful for a big portion of the game mm -hmm. and he also will probably transition into some very useful items for the team maybe he gets a hex maybe he gets a bloodstone or a heart just to lead the charge and with the amount of armor he has health is actually going to be really good on the death prophet but i still can't believe 30 minutes in we don't have a level 10 shadow shaman that's true and we're not even looking at his second level mass serpent wards yet this is a real problem for him this is a real, real problem for him. They need to correct this on the Shadow Shaman. And they're looking towards, uh, at this point, just the last out of towers. Level 1 wards will still be able to help. Oh, ice, 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 going for the combo on PPD. He's gonna land it. Oh my god. More charges, and he couldn't get the surprise up in time in the Ravage. It comes up from Universe. They're looking for Ice, 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 and they got him as well. But I'm laying, though. Their base is falling apart. DK, they're already there. inside on the Lana can hold him out. He can actually just let the ulti go. Mushi, they're coming in close to him. But Zion being thrown down. There's Lana finally letting the ulti go. Inside. He's being shredded apart by Muji Dolman. He has to use the chief. Now the Warak still aren't down yet. They can get rid of the wards. But we've got a burning who is in no man's land back inside the dire side base. The tier 3 tower will go down. He should be very, very happy. They still have their racks intact. Great play again here by DK. They trade off. They traded the invoker. They traded one for one and kills. They get a tier 3. Some damage on the barracks, force the glyph, force out the ravage even. They might be able to go for high ground in a moment. What's the cooldown on Nexus in 70 against 100 on Ravage? So if they hit the perfect timing window, I think these bottom ranks are actually DKs, forcing out both. Well, they forced out the cheese. The Aegis is still on Arteezy. Yeah. So perhaps that is going, uh, going to be an issue. And EG, they have to find a way of using this once again. And without Ravage, though, they're, they're not going to find a fight. And there is the Scythe indeed being picked up here by Zai. Mm -hmm. So they do have some sort of single target opener. The question is, who do you hex? when you jump in. At this point, it's got to be Weaver. It's, go it's got to be Weaver. Weaver's getting bigger as time goes by. I know you're still seeing a lot of problems being caused out by Ice 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 with his initiation, as well as by Death Prophet as well. But what are you really supposed to do? Like you, okay, you do have the Ursa, you can, do, you can find yourself the kills, but you can't rely on Ursa to do the damage when he's actually hexing in because the potential for him to be controlled is just too high because he doesn't have the BKB. If they're committing all of their focus to MMI, him. Oh, he, was whoa, he the blinked the gosh. Forward. Yeah, he blinked before the gush could connect on him. He's in the tree line. Yeah, Universe has nothing that can stop him here. Oh, Zai almost got in range for the Hex there. That was less than half a second away. Pretty long cast range on that, but... So quick for him and Wall. managed to catch so up. So quick. Yeah. Very fast blink there. And that was when EG wanted the fight. That was the Aegis the Mora now goes. getting yep. fully reclaimed. So uh, all the mana gets to come back the way of Arteezy. And with the boots of travel on ATZ, he's going to uh, be on split push duty here, trying to uh, to give EG a comeback in terms of map control here by just pushing out the lanes and being able to TP into the fights. But what that effectively means is his his t actual team fight impact is being delayed. When he ports in, a lot of his value is is just move speed and attack speed from the Midas boots of travel build. So. You know, the, the whole net worth thing is a little bit misleading for Arteezy because yeah. as far as actual fighting value goes, he, he is quite a bit below that 16.5k he's actually showing. Mm-hmm. Getting it even harder too, man. Like, Mushi is a bad no, this is the push though. I love this from EG. They have to go for it. They finally managed to reach a tier 2. It's time to strike. Ravage is ready. Universe with both Blink and Force Staff sitting on the back lines. Hex is available on Zai. Now she got DK to also burn their fortification. They're gonna Mushi, get this Mushi's forcing them back. They smoked up through the bottom, and they're gonna really try and find backdoor regeneration here with Max. Oh, ice, ice, ice will just try to break the TPs here. Well, Universe will not get out! He's in trouble, but Arteezy sticks around. The dust will pop. They see Ice Ice Ice. He's gonna lose his life with what he just did there. A lot of rags in the meantime. The range is gone. Mushi, arrow from Mason, holding him in position, living armor. You all set her up as well. The ulti is doing the work with the mass server boards. And now Ladder! He holds EG there! Mason's coming out, Mushi, he's almost out! He is out! 
on the bottom lane, the melee rag is still alive. That's the most important one there for EG. The fact great. that they also killed a fight side size is a nice perk. Great, great defensive play for EG. I was sure they were going to lose a full lane there. The, the Razor and Tidehunter were never there to defend, but they managed to hold on the back of a beautiful arrow from Mason, setting up for uh, not a kill on Death Prophet, but at least forcing Musi out of the base. So they do end up only losing their range barracks there, so so great play. And also great play from DK going for it, right? They mm -hmm. they see the opening, they realize, okay, EG will have to go back now. Isis basically sacrifices himself to stop two TPs. And uh, it's kind of a little bit reminiscent of the, the grand final from last year, perhaps. <laughs> but, uh, With no profit. Million though. dollar yules. <laughs> no million. <laughs> that would be a very, very cheap item becoming massively expensive. Obviously signed by Arteezy, sold in the store, just like his player cards. 17-9 to 9, though is now on the board, and okay, EG are trying to fo force out the lanes again so they can get some level of advantage. Actually, look at what Mason is building into now. He's finished his BKB, didn't finish up before Mjolnir, so he's looking to try and survive during these engagements. Still going to be very, very careful about the tree and protector, but as far as everything else goes, he's kind of okay. But what I'm worried about by building into the BKB is the fact that they cannot kill off Mushi. He's a, he actually has the heart coming out in the courier at the moment. He's going to have so many light points, so much armor as well because of the Shiva's card, the disabled because of your scepter, he can be taken into safety, and then you've got you're like your rod of eight, your Atos. So if you want to try and attack and you want to try and hold someone there, you've got this big tanky guy with a whole lot of spirits doing his work for him, and you can't do anything if you turn. 2.8k light points they have to get through on Mushi. They need to have this refresher on, on, uh, on Razor. It's kind of like is, the only way. This is where the problem is. Oh, Universe! Oh, Big Ravage up on top lane. Shadow Shaman's already down. Let him to let the ulti go. And that's just so they can buy Bottom some space. Bottom lane, He's coming again. Mason needs to hold him out. He's got the creep wave with him. Fortification is available this time for EG. Mason moving to the side, throwing down the arrow. Zai being pushed back by the deafening blast. Fortification has been used, and Zai able to hide in the tree line. Two seconds of still playing. Universe back on the front lines. Mushi Oldman, 100 life points on the racks. They're going to bring it down now. The counter's going to be there. Mushi TPing out. They have a stun. They have anything. Nothing is there. They get two kills. One on the Shadow Shaman before, and then the Invoker on the bottom lane, but Mushi takes the bottom racks and gets away with it. Meanwhile, Atizi has been trying to apply a bit of pressure in the mid lane. He actually has the gold for a side of his own if he wants to get that right now, which might be the call. They need so yeah. much control now to deal with DK, since I, I actually don't even know if the Refresher is going to be enough. I think it's more about just controlling the fight for so long that they can take out the other heroes and then end with taking down Mushi. But the reason I, I raised the question, who do you actually hex, is, well, if they hex the Weaver with the Earth, uh, with the Earth aside, they give so much space to Mushi in the fights. With Ice Ice Eyes also having a hex, they can kind of oh, make it. Scouted. The burning bug space to come in. Now Roshan almost on the sideline. The Buster Fields keep him burning out and looks like he's not going to come in. The Krom is in the battle of the fight. Artizi also put his hand of Midas back over on the Courier so he could grab the Aegis the model and Zion will take the cheese. So that's our fourth Roshan in 37 minutes. Fourth consecutive Roshan for EG. And they've taken one tier two with it. Hey, at least that is how hard this game is for the, them right now. The Roshan actually gives them an advantage of 150 gold. <laughs> it's, uh, it's huge, man. But their experience is still hilarious. For everything that's happening on this map, the experience graph as well as the gold graphs, they kind of mean nothing anymore. I, everything just comes down to the key items you got during the fight, and if you can bring down the cause of either line. Yeah. And in this case, is can you kill off the Weaver and can you kill off the Krom? Yeah, can you kill off Mason in a moment is also another question here. MMY is looking for it, but Mason actually will back off at the right time here, so not finding that gank. Bottom lane, they found Burning. There's a hack coming in. It's Zai going to work and Burning! Getting shredded, he can time lapse and BKB himself away. Running himself up. Universe, four stop. He's still under the protection of BKB, so he's going to be okay. He will up on the top lane, Mason leaps away on 80 life points, but the last attack comes in with the Shadow Shaman and Lanham going to work. Arteezy, she's an ultimate, hurts a hell of a lot there from, uh, from Mushi. But they do get the kill over on Mason, and Burning is able to survive. Burning, by the skin of his teeth getting out there. This is where I think, you know, an Abyssal on Zai instead of the Hex. They want the Hex to open with, but maybe with an Abyssal there, they actually... On Zai, they're gone on them and why? He dropped down the Mass Serpent Morse, just looking to force out the tower. Now it's just going to become food for the Ursa as well as the Tide. In fact, they gave all of it over to, over to Zai. And they're going to have to get, like, an AC over on this Ursa at the moment. Oh, and again, oh, Ice 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 with the Snipe <laughs> combo. Finding PPV, Sunstrike into Meteor, as well as the Deafening Blast. Easy kill for the Invoker here. Didn't even need to use the Hex. Holding on to that. 
in that kill. Maybe we have to add into the extra, like I was saying Weaver as well as, uh, as well as Mushi before, but now maybe we have to add Ice 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 into this mix. That's the thing that's really strange about this game when you look at the actual experience, because when you look at the distribution of levels on the Radiant side, you see two very low level supports, but the three other heroes are so far up and very, very much amongst the top here in the game. So yes, they're 12,000 behind, but I think at this point for DK, it's not about whether your Shadow Shaman is level 11 or level 14. I don't think that's the deal breaker here. Mm -hmm. It's the fact that your three cores all have their level three ultimates. Dyer's they have great farm on all of them. Fallen. And arguably, Trian is, it's okay that he's level 12. This hero is, <laughs> he's not built to be level 12. He's, he's not meant to be anything else. He's almost like the, the uh, bottom lane. Ice 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 is trying for it again. Great damage onto Universe here. Will four step out though. Is there going to be a Sun Strike? Looks like there isn't. Universe will get back to base. He's got Invoke off cooldown now. Damn, he's he putting a lot of pressure, though, on these lanes. He is. He keeps going he for the solo kills and forcing rotations. And he's just doing the bottom lane solo. Like, he moves back and then lets his four spirits do the pushing work while he farms up the Radiant Jungle. It's really, really efficient coming out here from Ice Ice Ice. And, like, what is EG meant to do? They try and jump out as a, a four-man, five-man to deal with their own jungle right now, and they can't because of the pressure on the bottom lane. You don't lose a Rax for it, but if you get one hero sniped off, then DK are like, hey, we got 5v4, we're good to go. So, here's what I'm wondering at this point. We've, we've come this far in the game now, 40 minutes in. We were talking about how EG probably wanted to end the game early, but yes. now we're, or not early, but around the mid-game with, with the kind of draft. They're coming, man. You, you just yeah. finished a BKB over on Zai. This is You're not... going to be looking to smoke gank up somebody, and I think they're just coming for the Invoker. Yeah, I think Ice 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 feels this coming right now. There's too many heroes missing on the map, or maybe they just oh, try the no, single hero paint again. They actually do! Oh, Mason! He's going to be attacked here, but this also means you got Scythe, you got Blink, it's all on cooldown, and they know they can try and... Oh, the Hex! the Hex! It's got to be time! Ice 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 won't get himself out of this one. He won't be able to evade the arrow. You all stepped her up. Five seconds until Blink, and he goes Invis! Living Armor's protecting him, but they do have the extra vision. Is coming in from the gem on the Enchantress. They bring down the Invoker, Meanwhile, but up on top lane. lane. Arteezy is trying to one man four. Ravage from Universe in Abushi and line of Abushi Dolderman. It's still going to work, but Arteezy, he's going to go down. It's only the Aegis Immortal, however. Abushi's ultimate has got another third of his duration left. They want to keep pushing in this one. Arrow's on cooldown. Can they find the retreating DK lineup? Lanham is high, and Abushi is running. Still into the cover of Nature's guys, but they both are. They need to have the Enchantress with them or else they cannot find them and he's too far away. And look at Burning. He's just headed straight down. He's going to finish up a butterfly and he's going to be good to go soon. You know what? I'm starting to wondering... Uh, to <laughs> yeah, great. I'm starting to wonder whether EG want to, uh, want to just take this very, very late at this point. So if they have the timing window planned with their strategy of winning the game at 20 minutes, this one could go for more than an hour. It's very realistic at this point. Yeah. And then you look over at DK lineup where we've been talking a lot about how powerful Weaver is in this game, but with DK item, or sorry, with EG mm. itemizing two hexes, with Ursa getting farm, we're gonna have a Marana getting somewhere as well. We haven't talked too much about Mason, but he's got decent farm and he's starting to get more and more items. And a Racer who's almost six slotted. Yeah. Maybe EG are actually able to take this in the super late game once Death Prophet will fall off. Because they see themselves as four cores, basically. Yeah, and on the, on the Radiant side, Weaver will be strong in late game. Invoker is a very strong late gamer too, but Death Prophet getting deceptively weak. You saw how long it took him to take down Arteezy, and that's before yep. Arteezy has the Kiras. So Death Prophet, I would like to say, generally peaks from around minute 15 to minute 45, and we're getting past that point now when Mushi's ultimate is just going to fall off quite a bit mm -hmm. here, and maybe EG can actually take advantage of it if they don't lose more than one lane. I'm actually wondering too what's going to happen. Like we, we're talking about four cores. What happens when PPD finishes up his Aghanim Scepter? In late game when you're pumping out that much pure damage? It may be just enough to, to rip through this DK lineup. Now, Lanham's doing a little bit of scouting inside the Dyeside jungle. He's going to see Universe continuously farming up. We'll also scout the fact that Refresher Orb is fully over on the Tidehunter. So they've actually got two Ravagers in 35 seconds to deal yeah, with. Their late game is actually really scary. Yeah. And I gave DK's lineup a lot of credit for how they were probably going to win if they got past the, the early problems. But... The fact remains, they only took one lane, and in a 45-minute game with this much farm on the table, it doesn't really matter that yep. you've lost a lane of Rex. Sure, it's a little bit of pressure going your way, but you can easily hold on. The second lane is going to be a big problem, but the way the game is going right now, I just don't see DK getting it. They haven't even been close to fighting at Roshan yet, and yep. it's just going to be another Aegis and Cheese going Aegis way soon if they don't go for it. Full AC is done on over on Arteezy. Now, Lanham, he's a long way up here, but Mason has no vision of him. 
So he's hiding in the tree line. Zai is also here, and initially it's Zai who's carrying the gem now. If he walks up just a little bit further on that top lane, he would see Lanham, but they're looking for somebody else, and they may get the big one. Mushi's inside the tree line. He has TP, Yule Scepter, so he shouldn't be too difficult to get himself away to safety if they do go on him. And in fact, there you go. He's already now just TPing himself out. As but EG you see, force top. EG are starting to get the intimidation factor on the map right now. DK are respecting them a lot and, and backing off here instead of uh, putting a lot of pressure this. As EG's they did actually backing 10 up. 15 minutes ago. EG's backing up. Remember, it's one minute until we have Roshan up. And that's probably going to be the keyest thing here for EG to secure. Let, let DK jump themselves around the map, try and find their initiations. Don't let Arteezy die in middle lane. Zai, oh, they're initiating And he actually breaks free. He breaks free of the overgrowth right now. Mushi Alderman, the arrow will connect. They're going to come on him and then lock him in. He has to yield to the Ravage. It connects on Burning. Secondary Ravage before Mushi gets the deck and Burning goes down. Arteezy holds, he will kill him off. They've got two buyback comes in. Burning kind of gives himself back in the fight. Arteezy though, the cheese will go on him. The Sun Strike almost killing off Mason, but they're chasing down burning they've got the vision and they've almost got him misses where is the attack he cannot reach him the plasma field the living armor keeping burning alive the attack of the hill again from Artizi. it is just not enough the bug is difficult to kill and he is almost and he is is he away to safety there's no tp scroll on burning so he has to run himself away and he will free himself from the eg chase and into the tree line where the living armor is bringing him up. I can feel the breath of relief from burning out here, actually. He got away from that. So two Ravages from EG. They managed to get two kills and, and get some more pressure out on them. I think this is okay. They did have to use the... They, they had double the buybacks cheese. as well. Those buyback came out from Ice 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 as well as from Burning during yeah, that burning, engagement. Actually, you're right. He bought back and almost oh, died. Oh, Burning! Oh, my oh. God! Oh, sh... Radiant's top is under Mistakes are made! And Burning is down for almost two minutes. It may as well be an eternity in this game. The bottom lane is being forced out right now. Bottom is Universe on the run. He's being hit so hard, but he's away to safety. But it's a tier two tower on the top lane that Arteezy is just going to take down. as well. Lanham, Lanham, shredded. They got Ice Ice Ice. He's blinked himself up into the dire bait, in fact. But it's top lane. Arteezy is there. His Aghanim's ultimate is tearing the tier three tower apart. And it's going to go to the melee racks as well. Plasterfield's trying to pick up this wave. MMY jumps up. No mass serpent more. Six seconds still on cooldown. And EG should back themselves up. I know they do still have the Weaver down, but the big man is going to spawn up in just over a minute. And they must get their map control back again. Roshan is going to be huge right now. The four previous ones haven't mattered as much. I, <laughs> I would almost say this, this next Roshan matters more than the previous four combined almost for EG at this point. And as well for DK, they cannot give this one away. Then I think it's at least one lane, if not two lanes of racks, that EG will be able to force, but maybe they don't they're, care. They're coming they're with no Ravage. Artesia's ultimate ready again. It's, it's still, t it's still uh, 17 seconds left on that Ravage from Universe. It's going to rotate top, though. Yeah, they're looking to finish off the melee racks. He was just trying to push the middle lane in and then turn on the Eye of the Storm. No fortification available here for DK and Mason with the BKB. Well, maybe MMY. Look at the damage he's taking. The four-star back. Mushi hexed up. He couldn't do much more. Universe Ravage will hit. He actually kills on the Shadow Shaman. The buyback comes out from him. So Millie Rax is gone. Zaya, they're going to keep fighting Mushi. He's currently tethered. He's tethered to Arteezy. He doesn't want to be part of this. You all set her up. The omen from Lanham. Mushi needs to get back, and he can't. He's down. EG have taken out the top melee racks. It's just a trade-off, though, for the bottom racks. And Weaver, five seconds, and they back up, giving respect. Everyone is TPing out. Remember, Roshan is now up, and Weaver is also alive again. And they have the second Ravage still. Universe only used one, and then immediately using the Refresher Orb to get it ready here and start the Refresher Orb cooldown to uh, make it start dropping here. This is a very tense moment. DK probably felt like they had pretty good control of the game, especially once Burning picked up the Lincoln Sphere as well as the Butterfly. He, he would have probably felt pretty safe, right? So there's two Hexes. They have to break the Lincoln with the first Hex, and then the second one will go through. And then if he doesn't die, he BKBs and time lapses. But even with that amount of defensive items, he's still being controlled by EG. EG, they're trying this again. They could be so quick about this. DK are not uh, almost there. Lanham's moving around the back of Mason. The bots will come in and it scouts out Zai in universe. And DK, they have their entire lineup here. Mason leaps away from Lanham. And now, well, the Plaza Field, they'll see very quickly Tree Protector is close. But Roshan is down. Aegis the Immortal into the hands of the Tidehunter. Zai doesn't want anything of this. He lets Arteezy have the cheese because Zai is about to finish up his full heart. And Arteezy also, this guy's got 7,000 gold. He's got so much money. 
Yeah, getting a refresher orb on Arteezy now I think would be really good. Double Hex, double BKB, and of course the double Eye of the Storm is probably the best item he can get right now, unless if he feels like he needs to become more of a physical damage dealer from another source than his ultimate, which is... The thing about the ultimate is it's not a reliable source of damage because it will always hit the lowest HP target. So if you want to choose your target, you pretty much have to, to go for some different type of, uh, of damage item, but it looks like it is indeed going to be the refresher. Immense base pushing power coming out from the Razor at that point. And EG are just looking like they're in complete control of this game. They might have a little bit more trouble killing off Mushi now. <laughs> the Yule Scepter in hand. He's got a Ghost Scepter to back him up as well. So, Mushi's just trying to make himself unkillable and get a full duration ultimate off. But I really don't think EG care. Like, if they need to, they can just get someone else to buy up maybe a Diffuser Blade, because the money is just rolling through. And Arteezy, he is starting that refresher off. The Perseverance is over on the Courier right now. Not he sure why he isn't buying it, actually. Yeah, it's, I think it's just because he's holding onto the cheese. But he could drop that at any point and take the refresher. Ice 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 is looking for a snipe Radiance off. Bottom He'll tower see Arteezy in the attack. mid, but no one is walking up into the Dire Jungle at the moment. Yeah, I think DK realized what, uh, what position they're in right now. They want to try and force the fight in the top lane, but at the same time, they really don't. There's double Ravage Radiance on Universe as well as the Aegis, so it's going to be very difficult. And, and he just getting... got a tower for free, basically. Zai with the Creep Wave as well, coming in through the bottom. I don't know about you, man, but I, if I was DK, I would be worried about Ursa actually soloing my racks at this point. Because he's still doing so much damage. You look at how much health he's got behind him. He's got 3.6k life points over on that Ursa. You think about getting through the Razor too, you got 2.7k, and then you're still going to take into account like your unstable current into all of this too. And then you've got Tidehunter who's taking away your damage, he's getting great control out. He can almost buy out another item shortly too. I don't know if he's considering finishing up a Shiva's Guard. If he wants to be selling four star for something else, but they're chasing down Ice Ice Ice. He got gushed up, so he can't blink, but the attack won't come in time. He goes invis, he does still have his blink up, and they can see him though. The Hex is there, and he refused to blink himself out. And now the jumping from Universe, he's body blocking or attempting. Will commit the Ravage. And look at the damage from the Ursa. Invoker is torn a new one, and EG may just finish up this top ranks. And Burning is desperately trying to add some pressure down the middle lane to stop this push from coming. But EG, they're going to push him through the top, see if they can just take Radiance out another tower. They can get a Rax as the Creek Wave coming. in. For the trade. Right, it's going to be quick Looks though. Like going, they're going all in. They TP'd Mushy Radiance mid. They don't score. have a second. They don't have a plan B. They're going to go for tier four. It's a full base race. They're coming back. They're coming back right now. They cannot let this base race happen. PPD, the first one to TP himself in. And EG, they are taking no chances here in the winner's bracket final. Semi-final. Semi-final. Close. <laughs> <laughs> Getting ahead of myself. Well, if they continue playing like this, they could be in the winner's bracket final. At they least could. this has been a, a great performance from them in this game. I mean, to be fair, we were worried. Oh, Mushi. But they've he just could, silenced Mushi. us completely. He could be in real games. trouble right now. Oh, Moonlight Shadow. He's walked straight right up now. next to him. It's almost worth a trade. Ravage, but Artiji comes in for the Hex. The link is on. And Mushi, are they going to commit Ravage? He's running himself away, but 140, 168 points, 198. This is too much. They can actually have enough damage in Artiji to kill a Mushi. The Ghost is protecting him quickly. Can he evade? He can't silence. You're stepping the Ursa up. Mushi, a 200 life points. He's in juking it around. He's Unbelievable! This man is on the most wanted list and he cheated. They couldn't capture him. A brilliant escape coming out from Krov. He looked dead to rights right there. But EG, they still are holding some level advantage here. The two Ravages are on cooldown now. This could be the time to strike for DK if they realize. But now with the, with the Refresher all picked up here for Arteza, he is pretty much re reaching his peak now. If he is to replace any items, it's in order to build for a late game in which Eye of the Storm is not his main damage source anymore. This is pretty much a fully stacked Razor build. He cannot really get anything more at this point, so... Yep. Apart from a new BKB, of course, but... But don't worry, they have an extra call. They can take Aegis, they can take Cheezus. Yeah. <laughs> then again, actually, no, Zai. He's the man who's blinking in. He's the man that needs to hold on to that gem of his. What are we, what are we looking at for Mason? So Mason has managed to build up a Mjolnir as well as 5,000 gold at this point. So we're going to see a Mirana probably transitioning into a Daedalus next. And then the physical damage from EG is going to be through the roof. Of course, the synergy between having Eye of the Storm drain all the armor of the targets and then having other heroes deal the physical damage. In a super late game situation, this Eye of the Storm is going to hit a lot of heroes a lot of times mm -hmm. before they die. And then it's about how you bring them down. You've got an Ursa who gets about 250 damage from clicking his ultimate button. 
and a Mirana building into a Daedalus, probably. Mm -hmm. They're going to hit hard. Well, right now, the hit was looking to come from EG on the bottom lane, but they know they don't have enough power right now when they try to defend the top lane, but Universe, he is a long way out right now, but he knows the Aegis is out in 30 seconds, so if he soaks up some damage here, it's going to be okay for him. He doesn't really need to let Ravage go. He can just accept the fact you'll die. Mason on the BKB, it went beforehand, so he's locked in position. He didn't even get him. No, they didn't. Not even once, and they used the Death Prophet ultimate. As well as the overgrowth, this is a big loss for DK and they need to get the hell out of there. Yeah, they're backing out. Mushi actually BT'd himself in, but the Krov ult is down for a minute and a bit, but it's okay. Roshan potential spawn time is still two minutes away. And it really doesn't look like EG is wanting to push into the base until they know they can get a really good trade, which is difficult up against this lineup of, of DK, or they're able to take out all of DK and then just push up with no one to defend. That's <laughs> literally the only two examples right now I can think from EG where they can really just force the issue. And for DK, there's two things I'm looking for right now. I'm looking for what's burning, what's burning going for, right? He has a Midas and 6,500 gold when he uses that the next time. He's going to go sell the Midas and we might see a full Daedalus. We might see him going for even a Rapier at this point. I don't know if they're feeling Ooh, that desperate Zai. yet. Zai in that middle lane. He's looking to jump over and towards Ice Ice Ice. If he oh, blinked himself over the tree lines, he might have actually had him because Arteezy was directly behind him as well. And now the other thing is, okay, so... There's no doubt Burning is going to get a damage item, so they have the physical damage going into the yes. late game. Where does Ice 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 go on the Invoker? Does he go for physical damage so they have more? Because I don't know if this so, uh, single, I, I wouldn't call it a single Core Weaver, but single physical damage Core Weaver is not going to be able to pull this up in the late game, I think. Yeah. And Bushi will definitely not be building physical damage on a death problem. He needs more range damage. I don't know if he wants to go beyond the Desolated, Daedalus, any of these above. Really? Arteezy, he wants to defend he turned soon on the because heat. this lane is falling he apart. That Arteezy, oh, he's going for team fours. EG are trying to finish this right now, and DK, they must return. The push from Mushi on the bottom lane. He's going, he, he can't, he, he can't, he's still his ghost and revive TP. He can't, he is, he's actually dying in the fountain right now to try and come back, but he's too tanky. Mushi is working against himself right now. It's GG, it's over. EG will take game number one. There it is. He attempted it. Mushi was too good for himself for the last moment, and EG. It looked very, very shaky for them. They could hold the advantage of experience the entire way, but it didn't look like they had it in the bag. But they do come back. They do come back and they take game number one. Greeting this awesome crowd here in Seattle. It's the home ground advantage, or the home team, really. And DK, I think they're going to be really sad with that game, Cinderin.